Thank you for joining us today for Jennifer Strauss and Associates in our Webinar Wednesday program, coming to you live from Washington, D.C. We are uncovering each part of the DFARS, or Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement, every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Eastern. As you know, the DFARS are the rule books for contracting with the Defense Department, and we have been moving sequentially. We started with part we started with DFARS Part 201 in January, and we will be finishing with Part 253 in December. Our webinars are every Wednesday and are provided complimentary. They are recorded and can be downloaded from our website and YouTube channel, which now holds over 450 of our government contracting webinars. In the interest of time, we do not take questions, so if you do have questions for our speaker, we will have information on the last slide of the presentation today. A special thanks to our educational sponsor, the National Veterans Small Business Coalition, for making these webinars possible. The NBSBC is the largest nonprofit trade association for veterans. Please visit their website for more information. Virginia PTAC at GMU offers free one-on-one -on -one counseling to firms in Virginia on federal, state, and local procurement topics. Online resources and group trainings are free with no restriction on business location. If you are interested in learning more, please use the links provided to explore what PTAC can offer. Set Aside Alert provides up-to-date news, information, and opportunities for small business federal contractors. Their daily opportunities alerts assure you won't miss the important source of thought and solicitation announcements providing details so you can jump on the hot one. Every two weeks, they deliver concise breaking news, events, regulations, and teaming opportunities. Please join the Reston Chamber of Commerce Government Contractors Council for regular meetings. Also, please stay tuned for information on their very popular B2G conference in May. Please contact Alicia Fields with the email shown on the screen if you have any questions. Federal contracting is a relationship game. Now get in front of your federal human sooner with the exclusive players and layers method with Judy Bratt from Judy Bratt and Summit Insight. You can connect with her on LinkedIn and find out more or visit growfedbiz.com today. If you are interested in selling to the federal government, you may need a contract vehicle. The most popular one is the GSA schedule. Learn more about the requirements, the proposal process, and how this contract vehicle may or may not be the right tool for you. Jennifer Schaus is teaching a series of classes, as you can see here, with the Virginia PTAC and Mary Washington University. All classes are listed on our website under the event section with the registration link. Okay, and now a little bit about us. Um, we work with U.S. federal government contractors, including product, service, and software firms. Our services range from market analysis reports to contract vehicles and compliance, and more information can be found on our website. We also have opportunities for your organization to advertise in our newsletter. We now reach over 23,000 subscribers, and this includes both contractors and government. Contact us for pricing information with the email shown on your screen. I also wanted to inform you of a new series in 2021. Um, we have launched a monthly series called the, live, the GovCon Live Q&A Cafe. Um, and this is the live webinar series held each month that will take place on the second Friday of each month this year at 12 p.m. Eastern. We have assembled a group of four panelists who are subject matter experts on a specific federal contracting topic. The panelists will make a short presentation about the topics listed here on your screen and then take your live questions about that topic. So for example, our panelists covered team agreements last week and on May 14th, our panelists will be covering subcontracting. Our panelists include attorneys, consultants, and other industry professionals and you can sign up on our website under the Q&A Cafe tab.
Sponsorships are available. Please email hello at jenniferschaus.com for a media kit with pricing details. Also, please note that you can use code DFARS for a $15 discount on each webinar. Okay, and now to introduce our speaker, Devin Hewitt. Welcome, Devin. We are glad to have you here with us today, and I'll now turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Hunter. I'm very happy to be here as well. And for those of you who are still here after all those slides, I very much appreciate it. I hope you will walk away with something you did not know previously. Okay, let's start. Next slide, uh, Hunter. Uh, well, okay, obviously this, uh, this webinar is on part 215 of the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement. Next slide. Let me talk a little bit about uh, the organization of the FAR and where the supplement um, is in that uh, process or protocol. Everybody should be aware of the FAR, the Federal Acquisition Regulation, and the FAR is the product of a collaboration between DOD, GSA, and NASA. And it is the regulations that apply to most acquisitions and procurements conducted by the federal government. Each agency has the opportunity to implement a supplement to the FAR, and that is um, a variety of regulations or policies uh, or deviations uh, from the FAR, although the FAR expressly states that these supplements shouldn't repeat or otherwise restate material that's already in the FAR and certainly shouldn't state or implement uh, requirements that are inconsistent or con contradict uh, the FAR content. Um, and so obviously if you have a DOD supplement and DOD is part of the uh, triad that implements the FAR, um, presumably DOD is implementing uh, the supplement uh, with information that is not in the FAR. Now, the, the DFAR is, as we call the Department of Defense Federal Acquisition Supplement, contains, as I indicated above, certain requirements, policies, deviations that apply exclusively to the Department of Defense and uh, supplemental regulations that apply to the DFARS or apply to the Department of Defense um, have a two in front of the, the FAR part that the DFARS supplement. So FAR part 15, which is contracting by negotiation, the supplement to that will be 252, part 215, whereas the FAR is 52, uh, part 15. Next slide. Contracting by negotiation, um, which is the topic of FAR part 15 and DFAR is part 215, is the rules and regulations that apply to negotiated acquisitions, competitive procurements, that otherwise aren't sealed bids. Um, negotiation, the term uh, therefore therein means uh, the ability of the federal agency to engage in discussions with offerors, um, although as you probably know, that's not always required. But the rules and regulations of part 15, part 215 have to address that type of acquisition. Now, what's interesting about the DFARS, there, there are a couple of areas that really are a departure from the FAR, and one of them is uh, something called the Defense Procurement and Acquisition Policy Memorandum that is dated April 1st, 1st 2016. This is a memorandum uh, that is issued by the Director of the Defense Procurement and Acquisition Policy Department of DOD. And the memorandum is quite detailed and includes guidelines for uh, pretty much every part of the uh, negotiated acquisition process 
from defining needs, market research, uh, to drafting the RFP, conducting discussions, discussions, source selection procedures, et cetera. By its terms, the, this memorandum applies to acquisitions conducted at, as part of a major system acquisition program and acquisitions with an estimated value greater than 10 million. My, um, my experience has been that the policies in this memorandum um, are relied upon in most acquisitions above 10 million. I was surprised to learn in the policy memorandum this, this um, uh, reference to major system acquisition. Um, it, it may be that that definition really means any acquisitions above 10 million. But as I discuss what's in that memorandum, I think you'll see that those policies um, appear to be universally adopted for most acquisitions above 10 million. It's important to remember that FAR Part 15 and DFARS Part 215 really is, is something different than um, and distinguished from other parts of the FAR, notwithstanding the fact that other, other acquisitions in these other parts of the FAR often resemble negotiated acquisitions and indeed sometimes follow or otherwise refer to other aspects of FAR 15 or 215. So for example, federal supply schedules procurements, what's addressed under FAR Part 8, it may be that there will be a task order competition that uh, refers to certain aspects of FAR Part 15 or 215, whether it's debriefings or discussions, et cetera. But with respect to this particular memorandum, it does not apply to FAR Part 8. It doesn't apply to acquisition of commercial items, which is often done by negotiated acquisition, um, simplified acquisition procedures, sealed building, um, orders under multiple award contracts, and here I'm talking about IDIQs distinguished from the federal supply schedules, broad agency announcements and uh, A&E service procurements, and then you know small business uh, research and technology transfer acquisitions. All of those types of acquisitions, as I mentioned, often do refer to FAR Part 15 or Part 215, but with respect to this memorandum that is issued by DOD, the uh, policies and guidelines in that memorandum do not apply to these other types of acquisitions. Next slide. Now there are three or four key areas in which the DFARS departs from the FARs in the area of negotiated acquisition. One is um, low price, technically acceptable source selection process. Uh, another one has to do with the consideration of small businesses and small business path performance in acquisitions. Another um, uh, major deviation, if you will, has to do with debriefings at the end of a source selection process. You will see um, during this presentation that these are significant parts of 215 and are only addressed briefly in FAR Part 15. So with regard to LPTA, the source selection process, I think most people are familiar with that acquisition approach and more importantly with the problems and the controversy over that approach. Uh, primarily that it is elevating price over quality and that with respect to a number of acquisitions, the, the um, elevation of price over quality has a significant impact on the operations of agencies who rely on this acquisition process. And indeed, um, in the bar, in the federal government contracts bar, you know, every time I hear a client or somebody in the industry complain about something that's going on in the government with respect to contractor support, um, I always joke that, oh, that must have been the lowest price bidder. 
Um, I think, for example, I was in a, a meeting and somebody couldn't open a, a drawer of a desk and was sort of cursing the desk that had been supplied to the government, uh, it, the government personnel. And, you know, I immediately said, oh, well, that, that must have been the lowest price bidder. So I think that that is a snapshot or a photo uh, that tells you a little bit about how controversial this acquisition approach has been in, over the last few years. Few years. So the baseline of a low price, technically um, acceptable acquisition, LPTA, is that uh, the agency has to consider cost price of a potential offer and the acceptability of the product or service. So there's no spectrum or uh, subjectivity, allegedly, with respect to the evaluation of the product or services. And, and in, in this way, it's much like a sealed bid procurement where bids are submitted um, uh, based on a technical spec and the government starts opening the bids live often and, and picks the lowest, lowest bid. Now, past performance is considered in a, a LPTA, which is not necessarily the case in um, sealed, bid, sealed bidding, but unlike what is typical um, in negotiation, negotiated acquisitions where there are various um, ratings that may be uh, showed or, or implemented with respect to an LPTA, past performance is considered mainly on an acceptable or unacceptable basis. So the, the bottom line is that there's not much distinction in the quality of the services or the offeror. It's, um, you know, it's either go or no go. Now, what the DFARS has done is identified with particular, particularity, all right, with specificity, um, those uh, circumstances in which LPTA may be used as an acquisition method. And, and there had not been previously this, um, this specificity, um, and this specificity is not in the FAR. So what the, uh, what the DFAR says is that LPTA acquisitions can only be used when you can express the requirements of the agency clearly and in terms of objectives and standards that um, lend themselves to a no-go, uh, no-go, go rating. Also, which is an interesting aspect here, is that an agency needs to consider whether or not um, such go no go evaluation um, really eliminates or affects the ability of an agency to take advantage of future technological developments, um, if uh, which might be realized if the agency used a different source selection process. So those are the two considerations that an agency must consider. Uh, prior to adopting an LPTA approach. And as I mentioned earlier, this is not um, uh, addressed specifically in the fall. Next slide, please. Now, the uh, DFARS Part 215 goes one step further. It provides those two general considerations, but then it also says um, expressly that this acquisition approach should not be used uh, in the following types of acquisitions. And if you look through this list, some of it becomes uh, obvious as to why LPTA is, is not appropriate for these type of net acquisitions. So IT services, cybersecurity services, CETA, electronic testing, and other knowledge-based professional services do not lend themselves to LPTA. And I think you can, you can divine why that might be the case. I mean, there is a gradation of expertise and experience in these areas that really affects the outcome of performance. And these are also important types of procurements um, that require judgment often and to to be able to take advantage of that in a contract and to ensure successful performance, um, the agency needs to be able to evaluate the ability of an offeror to provide that kind of judgment as opposed to just the services. So that's one category in which the DOD has expressly stated 
that LPTA should not be used. The second one, per personal protective equipment, which PPE, obviously in our pandemic life, it's become more important. And you know, like surgery, you don't really want the lowest bidder giving you your personal protective equipment. Uh, the same, I think, policy or reasoning is behind uh, contingency and other operations um, outside the United States, you know, obviously in Afghanistan and those areas. Again, you don't want to rely on the lowest bidder for such high risk acquisitions. Uh, again, another one, aviation critical safety item, uh, energy, engineering, engineering and manufacturing. And then auditing contracts. Obviously, auditing requires a high sense of judgment, a high uh, technical skill, experience, and has a significant impact to the government and DOD with respect to catching fraud, waste, and abuse, and just um, the management of money and tracking of money that comes in and out of the DOD through um, acquisitions, which is in the tens of millions. Next slide. Okay, the second area in which the DFAR is, uh, departs uh, from the FAR, and in this case, not as significant as LPTA, but it, there is a difference. The FAR provides that in bundled or consolidated procurements, the agency should uh, evaluate an offeror's past performance in meeting small business subcontracting goals. And those goals will typically apply to other than small businesses that are competing in a negotiated acquisition. Um, and the FAR also provides in a bundled or consolidated procurement, the agency should evaluate an offeror's proposed use or reliance in small business participation in performing the subject contract or task order. Now, the DFARS doesn't have the caveat of bundled or consolidated procurement. Uh, the DFARS provides that in any competitive acquisition, that requires a subcontracting plan, which is similar to subcontracting goals, as that term is used in the FAR. The um, use of small business participation should be considered. And in particular, agencies should evaluate the extent to which offerors identify and commit to using small businesses um, in performance, and that has got to be identified in the proposal. So the DFARS goes many steps further than the FAR with respect to evaluating large contractors um, and their reliance use in proposing small businesses. Next slide. Another issue is cost price. This isn't a significant difference, but I wanted to note it because there is a dovetail between the FAR provisions and the DFAR provisions on what is a, obviously a, a very important evaluation factor. The FAR requires price and cost to be considered in every source selection, but the FAR itself includes an exception for acquisitions conducted by DOD, NASA, and the Coast Guard. In the FAR, it states that the contracting officer um, associated with these agencies may choose not to consider price uh, if the acquisition is above the small acquisition thr threshold. Um, the acquisition will uh, result in a multiple award contract for the same or so similar services, or the solicitation states that an award will be made to all qualifying offerors. And I guess you can see, um, at least with two of these, that that's not such a big deal. When you have multiple award contracts, the competitions are going to be done under that contract, and the specific services are going to be identified in the task order competition. So it makes sense that the pricing corresponds to the specific services and that that is evaluated at the order level. Uh, with respect to uh, a award made, uh, being made to all qualified award, qualifying offerors, it's much the same approach. For example, in the federal supply schedule, 
uh, although the DFARS doesn't apply to that, um, you have all these qualified offerors who are, who are, for example, offering pencils to the federal government. Um, once an order is uh, is considered for that um, that schedule contract, or it could be a GWAC or you know best in class contract, then pricing can be considered, but not pricing at the inception of the actual. Award. Now, this policy of not considering price does not apply um, multiple award contracts that actually allow for sole source task order awards. Now, what's odd or, or, or maybe inconsistent is that the actual April 2016 memorandum says the cost of price must be considered in every acquisition. Now, remember that by its terms, that memorandum applies to major acquisitions above 10 million. So if you take the two together, the outcome is that DOD has to consider price in every acquisition except for those that um, exceed the simplified acquisition th threshold and are under 10 million. But, uh, you know, that's that's a technical interpretation, and, and what's interesting is that I'm not so sure that that's actually what happens in practice. Next slide. Okay, the, the next area in which the DFARS is far more specific is the actual source selection process. One major difference um, is that the DFARS explicitly states that contracting officers should conduct discussions with offerors um, in acquisitions that have a value in excess of 100 million. I think this is significant because more and more, as those of you on, on this webinar may, may note, um, the government more and more is awarding significant contracts without discussions. Um, and it used to be that discussions were the norm, but that is becoming more and more rare. Um, and so I, uh, what this regulation um, states is that in the larger acquisitions, and 100 million is a very high threshold, that discussions should occur. And the policy beyond that, this, I believe, is that discussions do allow more competition because you keep in the competitive range those offerors that have something that's not quite right or not as strong as other offerors, but possibly could reach that level through an exchange of information. And by doing that, the government gets the benefit of more competition or possibly an offer that has a really good or exceeding normal standards um, approach that the government otherwise wouldn't get the benefit of if they um, had to award on discussions. And um, that primarily is because if you award on discussions, anything that doesn't comply with the requirements of the solicitation, that proposal can't be considered, otherwise it would be subject to protest. So it does limit the hands a bit of a government acquisition official when you say you're gonna cut, conduct without, you're gonna award without discussions. And I think the DFARS has put a marker here to say, well, in these large ac acquisitions, you need to go the extra mile and really vet these proposals because those are large acquisitions that are very important to the government and um, even nuances could have a significant impact on performance. Another issue uh, that is specified in the DFARS with regard to source selection procedures are that DFARS mandates that risk be evaluated as part of a technical evaluation. Risk is not separately identified as an evaluation factor in the FAR, although um, in protest law, there is some law that says that risk is an inherent part of every technical evaluation. But that you know is case law and there have been exceptions to that. So I think the DFARS um, expressly addressed this for that reason, uh, that, re that risk in itself is going to be rated. Now, the DFARS uh, provides two different ways this could happen. 
It could be through separate risk ratings, um, ratings for risk and then ratings for technical. And the memorandum, uh, in this case, provides this, per, this color rating procedure, which the, um, the DOD adopted many, many years ago and now, you know, is, is commonplace. Uh, not off, not often in the civilian acquisitions, but you see this all the time now in DOD acquisitions. So you could give these uh, adjectival ratings, color ratings separately, or you can, can you can define a technical rating to include risk as part of that rating. But what's important there is that you need to make sure the definition lines up. And encompasses um, encompasses what could contribute to risk. So, as it states on this slide, the rating itself has to refer to potential di for disruption, increase, increased cause, degradation of performance, the government oversight, oversight, or otherwise unsuccessful contract performance. So, if you now this this is a little bit um, esoteric in that. Often DOD solicitations don't indicate how proposals will be evaluated. Um, and that is something I think that offer should focus on. Um, if you are aware of how the ratings will go and what the ratings mean, you can uh, tailor your proposal uh, to that approach. So uh, uh, while I think many of the solicitations do it, um, include how things are going to be rated, I think um, it's entirely appropriate to ensure that in a solicitation and maybe even make that a ground for protest if you don't find that in a solicitation in a negotiated acquisition. Next slide. Few briefings. Debriefings is the last area in which the DOD uh, departs from the FAR and um, acquisitions that are done um, with the NASA, with NASA and, and GSA. The importance of debriefings uh, is twofold. On the one hand, debriefings give you information about your evaluate the government's evaluation of your proposal and why you may have gotten less than the perfect score. So that's obviously important feedback for any offeror that doesn't receive a contract award. But debriefings have a role in the ability of protests. And so not only do you get information regarding uh, the evaluation, it also is a gateway to protests uh, to the extent uh, the information you received during a debriefing suggests to you that something was not quite right. And um, if you don't recognize the interplay between debriefings and uh, protests, then that opportunity to protest may be cut off. Most of the time, uh, if you are going to file a protest, the basis for the protest will come out of a debriefing. Uh, and that could be an oral debriefing or as DOD is doing more and more often through a written debriefing. And indeed, sometimes a written debriefing um, is included with a notice of unsuccessful award or an offer or notice of an award. If you're going to protest, one of the key aspects of a protest is obtaining what's called the seek a stay. CICA stands for the Com Competition and Contracting Act. And the idea in this act is that one way to ensure competition and therefore ensure the best outcome at the best price for the government, i.e. the best value, is to allow for protests. And one way to allow or put teeth into the protest opportunity is to require the agency to suspend performance of the contract awardee or the task order awardee. And the reason for that is a couple of reasons. One is that if the agency has gone down the road with an offer war and thereby incurred costs or have actually expended costs associated with that performance, 
there is a real cost um, to the outcome of a prote protest that indicates that award was improper because then they have to make uh, a termination for convenience um, or a suspension that nonetheless will have cost the agency money. Uh, and that affects a protester because with respect to protests at the Government Accountability Office, at the GAO, agencies are not required to um, follow recommendations made by the GAO in a protest decision. And there's a, a very complicated reason talking, you know, relating to separation of powers for why that is. And indeed, 99% of protest decisions are ultimately followed by agencies. But as a theoretical matter, they are not required to um, do what GAO says after a protest. And so if that's the case, and the agency has incurred a lot of costs under a contract award, has gone ahead with performance, and there thereafter is faced with a recommendation from the agent from the GAO that they didn't do something right, they need to go back and redo it. The agency has the opportunity to weigh the costs it's already expended and the costs it might incur resulting from a termination for convenience with you know the reputation or the flack it will get for not following the GAO recommendation. And since budgets and costs are, are always a significant issue for agencies, the fact that they've expended those costs or may have to incur those costs in the future is a significant um, chilling effect on the agency actually following the GAO's recommendation. So that's a long way of uh, explaining why a stay is very important for a protester and for the protest approach, uh, the way of making sure the government follows the rules um, is successful. Without a stay, um, you really are putting the protester at a disadvantage. And if a protester, you know, the protest process, um, as was described when SICA was passed, you know, it allows for private attorney generals um, and emboldens protesters to keep the government honest. So, SICA stay, really important, but a debriefing is directly linked to a SICA stay. And that is because in order to receive a SICA stay, when you file a protest, that protest has to be um, filed within five calendar days after the debriefing date in negotiated acquisitions. It also applies in certain task order protests, but for sure in negotiated acquisitions um, conducted under FAR Part 15, or DFARS Part 215, the five calendar day um, applies. Well, the date of the debriefing or the conclusion of the debriefing is not obvious when you have a written debriefing. And that's because FAR Part 15 requires a variety of things to be discussed in a debriefing and also states that offerors must be given an opportunity to ask questions during the debriefing. Now, when the FAR was promulgated, this made perfect sense because back in my day, most debriefings were conducted orally, either on the phone telephonically or in person. But what agencies discovered, and DOD is always at the forefront of procurement developments because of the um, frequencies and the, the size of their procurements. What the agencies found was the informality of a debriefing lended um, to an environment where government personnel would say things they shouldn't say. Uh, and that resulted in fodder for, de for protests and complicated matters greatly. So more and more, uh, the DOD agencies adopted for written debriefings which um, attorneys uh, in-house in, in the government have an oppor opportunity to review and the words can be um, selected and expressed very carefully. But the issue with writ uh, written debriefings 
is, well, okay, uh, the agency still has the obligation to answer or allow an offeror to ask questions about the information they've received in the debriefing. Um, if an offeror, a disappointed offeror, uh, receives a written debriefing and goes ahead and asks questions, when is the debriefing closed? When does that five calendar day uh, time frame uh, start? Does it start when they receive the debriefing because they've received all information that the agency is required to provide? Or does it start at some time later? You know, the bottom line is, when does the debriefing end? Um, if you're doing an oral debriefing, and an, and an offeror is allowed to um, ask questions and then has no more questions, the debriefing is closed once everybody leaves the building or, or the telephonic conference is ended. And it's not so easy when, uh, there is a, when there is a written debriefing. And this, for protest lawyers like myself, this has caused a lot of angst because five days is not a long time to uh, draft a protest and um, as many of you probably know, the government thinks it's very clever when it gives a debriefing uh, on a Thursday and um, knows that two of the very precious five days are over a weekend because I think they're convinced since they don't work weekends, lawyers don't either. Uh, and it always makes me shake my head because, you know, almost uniformly you're getting the debriefing, you know, on a Thursday or Friday. Uh, so, you know, if that's the case, you know, your clients may not be available, not everybody may be on deck, and trying to get all the information that you need to put in a uh, protest, um, five calendar days is a very short time frame. So, you, you want to be able to push it uh, farther out. You want to um, have the opportunity for your client to ask questions um, while you're sort of getting the background, and then take advantage of the time it takes for the government to respond to those questions. Suddenly, you know, what could be a, a hard stop five day window could turn into a 15 day window and everybody you know, has opportunity to breathe when that window is extended. So that is not, that still is the case with um, civilian, um, civilian acquisitions. However, the DFARS has listened to agencies and uh, the procurement community, the government contracted community, and it issued a deviation and a memorandum uh, called Enhanced Debriefing, which addresses this um, circumstance specifically. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a, a memo that went out to all acquisition personnel in the Department of Defense. And it has certain procedures that are very different from procedures that you see in a debriefing context uh, for civilian acquisition. What you get now, uh, or supposed to get, in a DOD debriefing context is actually a redacted source selection decision. You should get the actual decision um, that discloses, um, at a minimum, the discussion about your proposal and may disclose other aspects of that decision or the best value trade-off, which is generally um, used more in, a, in negotiated acquisitions than the LPTA. Um, you know, the discussion of the best value trade-off, although, you know, the agency has to be careful because every agency expressly is instructed not to disclose proprietary information of other offerors. But in any event, you get to have in your hands the official document, whereas in other debriefings, um, you know, in the civilian sector now, um, you get little excerpts or shorthand that makes it very hard to understand really what the narrative is of the agency on the evaluation of your proposals. So um, for these large, you know, excess of $100 million procurements, uh, the agency uh, within DOD is required to give you that redacted uh, source selection um, memo or decision. And I have found that DOD um, has done this uh, in, in procurements below 100 million. 
just as I've indicated previously, I see the DOD agencies use that color rating method in acquisitions uh, below 10, um, above 10 million or below 10 million, whatever the, that threshold was. I've seen them issue uh, the redacted source selection decision as well. If they don't do it, as a protest lawyer, I often ask them for it. Um, and although they know, you know, it's not an excess of 100 million, they often, you know, there really is no reason why they they can't do it in in an acquisition that's valued below 100 million. Uh, the DFARS also expressly provides that an agency should provide debriefings in all acquisitions. Um, now this you know, it doesn't seem to be as broad as it appears because in all acquisitions, but this is in DFARS Part 215, which really doesn't apply to all acquisitions. It applies to all negotiated acquisitions. Um, but it, there may be context um, in which the, the agency doesn't provide a debriefing. Frankly, I don't really know where that would be, but, you know, now there's an explicit statement. Now, the, the, the crux of this enhanced uh, debriefing memo or deviation from the FAR, really, is this timing issue that I've raised. Uh, again, it's an acknowledgement that most debriefings by the DOD agencies are done in writing. And what this deviation states is that offerors are allowed to submit questions within two business days of the initial debriefing whether that's oral or written, but as I've noted, it's generally written. The agency, furthermore, must respond to these questions within five business days. And the debriefing is only considered concluded when the disappointed offeror, aka the protester, receives that response. The, you know, the, the, the five, calendar, five calendar day window starts the day after. So that makes it very clear. That uh, eliminates the confusion that has arisen and still exists with civilian uh, acquisitions. Now, there is an interesting um, interpretation of this that recently came out in a case, um, because what if an offeror doesn't ask questions? That is the debriefing concluded then when they receive the written debriefing questions? or sometime later. And that has been resolved by case law, by a GAO protest, which um, says that uh, the five-day calendar window will start um, the day after the two-day window for filing questions has expired. So that is a new Hi, everyone. Um, just stay with us as we um, review the technical issues that are happening right now. Um, hopefully, we'll get that fixed soon.
Okay, well, we'll see if Devin is able to rejoin us, um, but since this is the last slide, um, I just want to thank you for attending, um, and please reach out to Devin if you have any questions um, or comments regarding uh, what she presented on today. Um, and Devin, if you are still able to um, hear us, thank you, Devin, um, for a great presentation and sharing your time with us today. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us for this webinar. Um, the recording will be on our website and YouTube channel um, within the next 24 hours. And please join us next week as we cover more parts of the DFARS. Hey, Hunter, I'm back on. I don't know. My bad. I don't know what happened. Um, do you want me? To, do you remember what slide I was on and whether I have to repeat anything? Yeah, it was just this slide. If you wanted to um, finish up this slide. Okay. Um, did I even address this slide? Um, I think you, you know? were part way through it. Okay. Well, I am so sorry, but uh, technology is not my thing. Uh, okay. So they have to provide a source selection, redacted source selection decision. Uh, in procurements above 100 million, my experience has been that they often do it in procurements below 100 million. Uh, and if they don't, I've often, as a protest lawyer, I've often asked DOD to do it, and, and they do it. It really, you know, they don't have to, but there's really no issue with doing it. Uh, the real importance of this uh, enhanced debriefing, though, has to do with these timeframes. As I mentioned, they're critical for a protest. Um, and in particular, they address now the issue of receiving a written debriefing. Um, although they, it applies to all debriefings, but you know the issue generally arises with written debriefings. So now an offeror is allowed to uh, submit questions. They have to do it within two business days. And the agency must respond to these questions. Um, and they have to do it within five business days. And the debriefing is considered concluded only after the disappointed offeror receives that response. So the five-day window would start the next day. Uh, now, there is a nuance to this um, that came up recently in a protest. It's not in the memo. Um, and that is, well, what if an offeror doesn't ask questions? Um, you know, when is the debriefing concluded? And you, know, you would think it seems like it would end when you receive the written debriefing um, because that's the debriefing, and you haven't extended it. But indeed, that's not the case. Uh, the five-day window starts not when you receive the written debriefing, if you don't ask questions, but rather after expiration of the two days that are afforded a disappointed offeror to ask questions. So nobody really knows whether an offeror will ask, a disappointed offeror will ask questions until that two-day window has been um, has been completed. So if there are no questions submitted on the you know end of the second business day, then that five day clock starts uh, running the day afterwards. And finally, um, this sort of reiterates the applicability of the DFARS and um, that DOD memo that I referenced earlier is that uh, this deviation doesn't apply to task order awards under an IDIQ, which of course that's FAR Part 16, or other type of multiple award contract. It doesn't apply to GSA buys, it doesn't, which is FAR Part 8. It doesn't apply to commercial item buys, which is FAR Part 12, and it doesn't apply to sealed bidding, which is FAR Part 14. So, um, you know, most protest lawyers are very familiar with this deviation but um, I think it's important for those in industry to know about it because five days is not a long time. And to the extent you, um, you are in, um, you know, in, in house talking about the potential of a protest, you know, that could take some time and, and you may eat up these five days. Um, and then one thing I'll mention, this is not different in the DFARS that, than the FAR. But, you know, in order to get a debriefing, in order for the agency to be required to give you a debriefing, you have to notify the um, agency within three days that you want a debriefing. Uh, so, you know, what I tell clients is the moment you get the notice, ask for a debriefing. And then, um, you know, if you have it or as you're looking forward to it, start thinking about that five-day clock. 
All right, well, that that is it. Uh, again, I apologize for the uh, hiccup, um, my bad. But um, if you have any other questions or if I have completely screwed up something and, and you're very legitimately confused, please reach out to me. I'll try to, I'll try to set the, uh, put the ship upright. Thank you. Yes, and no worries, Devin. Um, definitely complications come up um, as we've moved on to more online format. Um, and thank you for sharing your time with us today and for a great presentation. Um, and like I said earlier, thank you to everyone who joined us for this webinar. Um, the recording will be on our website and YouTube channel um, within the next 24 hours. And please join us next week as we cover more parts of the DFARS.